So from celebrating the past, we're gonna to move to clarifying the present. And so Kervin's gonna come and share, and that's gonna be followed by a time of, of Q&A. Well, I've been uh, privileged to get to know some of you by walking around the room, and uh, now I'll just take a moment and stand and look at you to, uh, to wonder where you've come from and uh, what you bring into the room, what questions do you bring into the room, and uh, what heart passions you bring into the room and you're looking back at me and you're probably wondering the same things and uh, so most of you in this space uh, don't even know who I am uh, I've only been in this role it'll be two months coming uh, two months two years coming July 1st and it's been a great uh, joy and privilege for me to get to know the leaders and a lot of the people on this side of the country and uh, I look forward to more of that. I'm getting better at remembering your names and more importantly remembering some of the odd names of your churches out here. <laughs> or, I mean by that I mean the towns that you're coming from and all of that uh, and it's 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 a great learning experience. I want to talk my my presentation is two parts. The first part is uh, a bit about myself and my own journey in ministry. And then the second part will be speaking directly to the present. And that part is gonna be uh, on, on three themes. My way of being, uh, some regrets and challenges that I face as the president. Uh, the word president, by the way, means preside over. And uh, presiding over uh, is an interesting experience for me, particularly uh, of a national church. And then the last part, I want to speak directly to the vision that God has put on my heart for uh, our denomination, our community of churches, and then specifically uh, to uh, what I believe about youth ministry. So, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, that'll take about 15 to 20 minutes. So, uh, I want to start by just saying, you know, every parent every pastor and youth leader and myself as the president we carry hopes and fears uh, for uh, particularly youth that's the theme of the day so i'm a parent i have two boys my oldest is 35 the youngest is 32 my oldest boy's name is jordan he's married and we have three grandchildren and uh, there are pride and joy in terms of the way they're parenting their children uh, to love Jesus. And they're seven, five, and three, and they love Jesus. And we're very proud of them. My youngest son's name is Tyler. Tyler is 32 years old. He's a special needs uh, adult. And uh, he's about seven-ish years old in his mind with teenage attitude. <laughs> So he has lots of uh, ambitions and aspirations, uh, like getting married. And we would want that for him, but I keep telling him, you have to know everything there is to know about being a good husband before you can get married. So those of us that are married, have we figured it out yet? <laughs> but he has, uh, you know, he's a forever teenager in a lot of ways, in his way of being. So parents have hopes and parents have fears uh, for their children. And pastors have hopes and fears for the youth that you, you are responsible for. In my ministry journey, I was never a youth pastor. And, uh, but I always had youth pastors or youth leaders that I was uh, privileged to work alongside of. And so we carried as the lead pastor, hopes and fears for the youth that were uh, in our ch under our charge. That was the same for me when I served as uh, the president of was Hillcrest College in Medicine Hat. So they were more young adults at that point than teens. But those hopes and those fears were very real uh, in our hearts as they are in yours. And it's the same for me as, uh, as your president. Uh, the hopes and the fears that I carry uh, for the youth are no different than I think when 
I thought about parenting and then pastoring and all of that. So those are real. Those are very real in us. And uh, when you think about it, the hopes that we as parents and pastors and myself carry relate to helping youth become everything that they were born to be in terms of their potential in, in all domains of their being, becoming amazing citizens, uh, becoming amazing friends, becoming amazing uh, laborers in the vocation that uh, God takes them into, becoming amazing people of faith, that they walk with Jesus in, in wherever their feet take them in life. And then, of course, the fears are, uh, you know, that they won't achieve the potential that God had given to them. And so we pray about that, don't we? And we plan, as we've talked about, you know, through this first session. We, we pray and we plan and we spend time, we make sacrifice, we do all of these things so that the hopes that we have for these beautiful human beings become reality. And, and then we fight against those fears to minimize anything and everything that might derail them from achieving uh, their God-given potential. So, you know, my question is, why are you here? And uh, you know, this is so amazing to me. I had no concept that we would have a room full like this. And uh, you ought to be proud of yourselves by demonstrating your very presence today that you care and that you're curious about what the future will hold for the youth that we love and care for. And we'll get into that uh, this afternoon. I do want to uh, say uh, honor uh, this first session that we had, Dan and uh, Marty. Thanks for planning all of this. Uh, you put a lot of work into it, and we appreciate that. There was a phrase that uh, came across my mind years ago called, good beginnings never end. Good beginnings never end. And this uh, focus on the past is all about good beginnings. The good beginnings that we've experienced through uh, the plans that people <coughs> laid and the plans that people executed have laid an amazing foundation of which you gave testimony uh, of that today. I think of uh, you know, the good beginnings that never, ever, it never end are about youth leaders and youth pastors and camp leaders and parachurch leaders and people like Gavin there that you've honored already, and of course his wife Peggy, they were a team, weren't they? And Mark and Jamie over here, and Allison and Mark on, from the other side of the country. You know, these people became catalysts in the life of this uh, denomination, and there were people that were before them that were. Someone mentioned Dennis Bell and the contribution he made, and you know, Mike Wright's name wasn't mentioned, but Mike is, has been part of our journey uh, for these past years, and uh, don't want to forget Jillian Zettler. I don't know if you're here today. Are you Jillian? I didn't know she could make it today or not. But you know that list is longer than what I just said. But but uh, you know good beginnings never end because of people who are giving their lives to the cause of Christ, and and that includes now us, and it includes the generations that will come after us. So so we just honor uh, all of those uh, people. So I want to talk about the present. I want to talk about my way of being. And uh, you know, this may matter to you, it may not matter to you, but I hope it today, I hope it will matter to you when you think about it. And so this will just give you a sense of uh, at least the ideal that I want to achieve in giving leadership. And uh, I, I begin with the word love. Uh, but the way I declare that value in my life. Uh, some of you, if you've received an email from me, you'll know that I, my, the signature on my email is your friend and fan of God's future in you and through you. And that's a, a goofy way in some ways of saying I love you. And I long to be uh, the friend of any human being that I meet. It doesn't mean I always am. But I'm not responsible for that. I'm responsible for my ambitions and my desires and my way of being. That uh, I grieve, actually, when uh, 
people send me messages that they don't like me or they don't want to be my friend or whatever because this is my natural bent. And to be the fan of human beings and to be the fan of their potential and, and their kingdom potential is how I give my life, uh, have given my life, all my life. Uh, you know, I've been in ministry now, I think, 35 years or so. But, you know, I don't remember a day that I didn't know Jesus. So uh, I remember in elementary, uh, always watching out for the, 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 the person that was last picked on a team. Some of you may have been that person. Uh, or, the, or the people that were just different in school. And I, for, for whatever I, uh, reason, but the grace of God, of course, you understand that, was drawn to those people to help them become everything they, they were intended to be. And so, you know, my son Tyler, he reminds me of that every day because he will never achieve his potential without some human beings in his life. And uh, so I am your friend and fan. I'm the friend and fan of youth and children and singles and special needs people and, and young adults and adults and seniors that are in our churches. The second value is to listen. And uh, I'm not always the best listener, but boy, oh boy, I sure want to be. I try. Uh, I go into churches and uh, I won't go into a church unless I get to meet with the board because I want to listen. I want to listen to their story. I want to listen to what makes that church tick. I want to listen to the struggles that are going on. I want to listen to their ambitions. And then, and then we can talk about that and, and pray together and so on. And I'm convinced that uh, listening becomes uh, uh, vitally important, particular in this age of complexity. Uh, you as youth leaders and youth pastors, you know that. The changing world of youth is like it's on warp speed. And uh, I don't know how you do it, actually, in terms of staying. Maybe you don't feel like you're staying ahead of the change, but at least staying with it and being the presence of Jesus in the lives of these youth that are struggling with stuff that we never struggled with. You know, the sin in our day was going to movie theaters or a bowling alley or it's tough, yeah, it's tough, yeah. <laughs> you know, drugs were just coming on the scene, at least in the town that I grew up with and all of that. So you have a tough job. And so to listen to one another. And then that moves into the third value is learning. Just to listen and learn. And, uh, you know, to learn about living for Jesus in this age and learning how to live a lead in this age. At, your world isn't my expertise. My expertise is in a different world, a different realm. And so learning me, for me, to, to learn from you uh, becomes critically important. And that comes to the fourth value, which is to lead. And leading is very different for me at this level of responsibility than it used to be. It was actually easier for me when I was in my last church where I served, a Center Street Church in Calgary, because the youth leadership team and the children's leadership team and the seniors leadership team were just down the hall from me. And I uh, was able to have conversation with them whenever I wanted to about how things are going and what they're thinking about and what's the latest trend and what do they need for resources and all of that. Well, I'm a long ways from that now in terms of the operational dynamics that you live with. So my, my leadership uh, uh, learning curve is very different. And, uh, but I will learn and am learning. All of that uh, is wrapped in my own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you, there isn't a day goes by that I, don't, that I don't pray for you, not by name, because that's a long prayer list then, isn't it? But out of my prayer, personal prayer journey, I pray for you. So I want to give you an example. This is what I prayed for you this morning. So Psalm 37 is one of those amazing 
long psalms that uh, David uh, wrote. And he t uses the word fret in there three times. And he's saying, fret not. Do not fret in that context when evil rules and reigns. Do not fret when evil people turn against you. Don't fret, don't fret, don't fret, don't fret. <laughs> because he says, they're like flowers. They're going to fade and die and they will be no more. Well, we live in an age where evil surfaces in all kinds of forms. And sometimes it's through people, but sometimes it's through ideologies uh, and values, of course. And, and the scripture is saying, don't fret about that stuff. The third, third principle that's in there is don't fear. Do not fret. Do not fear. So we don't have to fear the future. We don't have to fear even the present reality because it comes to the third word. Do not fret. Do not fear. Do not forget who God is. And there's about six promises in that psalm that are meant for us as leaders to hold fast to. So today, I prayed for you. I prayed those themes up to heaven for you. And what I believe that as we pray in the name of Jesus, the very presence and power and provision of Jesus is released into the space that you occupy. Do you understand the significance of that? It is because of the name of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, that we don't have to fret or fear. But we do have to remember it and pray it with confidence. Pray the, 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 in the name of Jesus. We pray it with confidence. And as we do that, we become invincible spiritually. And you become stronger and more powerful as you serve the youth that you love and their families. I have some regrets and challenges. Three came to my mind. There may be more. I'll probably are more. But I think these are important for you to hear. In the first 18 months of my uh, service as president, I spent a lot of time uh, traveling around this country, and I met a lot of people, a lot of pastors and a lot of lay people. My regret is I didn't take enough time to meet you. Some of you I did meet, and we had brief conversations and all of that. That's a regret I have. <coughs> because I would have got to know your hearts sooner than today. My second regret is the discovery assessment project, a youth focus that we did in Calgary in November uh, 2017, was derailed. It really didn't uh, get traction. And I failed to get that back on the rails. And I do apologize for that. I think the enemy loves to derail good plans. And I just failed to get that back on the rails. The third one is that Canada is geographically huge. <laughs> I know that now more than I ever did. And uh, it's, it's diverse. Do you know that you people are different out here? <laughs> I did not know that. You're probably different, different, divergent. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm discovering that too, that even within the province there, I did not know that. You see, for, for 20 years of my ministry, I was in one city in one church, and I, I think that affected me in terms of thinking that everybody's the same everywhere you go, but it's not like that. So there's this divergency uh, that's across our country. And, and the other piece is uh, the historical context that, that I was hearing today. You know, I'm still trying to you know, discern or trying to remember, okay, what was Youth Builders about and, and Ledge? And I heard one from you, Jen, 
accelerate. That was a new word to me. But that's historical context that I'm still learning and, and getting ca caught up on. And I think that, you know, I, I, I just failed to ask the right questions of, you know, where's Joel? He just slipped out there. You know, Joel's been in your world forever, kind of a thing, not as long as Gavin there. But I just failed to ask those kind of questions. I think there was a level of naivety in me that, that didn't pay attention to that. So, so why, why are all those things important? to me? Well, they're important because those things create the, 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 the foundation from which I think and then the foundation from which I lead in this role that uh, I'm still learning about. So I guess I'm saying to you, uh, thanks for your patience. Mostly, some of you haven't been patient with me, I get that. Uh, I'm not always patient with everybody either, but, but thank you for that. Uh, and I'm asking you to be patient with me and uh, the navigation team, which is our senior leadership team um, that, that works with me, uh, to be open and honest and uh, communicate with me. To <coughs> say, you're not quite getting this curve and you're quite, not quite getting this right. That, uh, that stings sometimes, uh, so I hope you can say that with love. Uh, I, I say scud missiles come at me once in a while from various places. And that's part of the price we pay in leadership, I get that. Uh, but we learn together, and, and that's what we're going to get into this afternoon. My vision for EMCC. Somebody tell me what time it is. Okay, give me... Three minutes. So, uh, yeah, you've, some of you have heard me say this if you've been at regional gathering or coming to assembly. You know, the song that Jesus put on my heart uh, coming into this role was based on Jesus' words out of Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me, and he's appointed me to do seven things. And he was quoting Isaiah 16. <coughs> so the anointing isn't my anointing. The anointing is our anointing. Jesus has a very clear destiny in mind for the kind of church that he would like to see the Evangelical Missionary Churches of Canada become. And it has everything to do with helping people to be set free from the bondages that the enemy has brought into our lives to arriving and achieving the potential that Jesus has in mind for it. The way we say it, uh, you have said it for longer than I'm in this role, is, is the way of Jesus. And Jesus has deposited this language into this denomination for us to steward into the real life of youth and young uh, children, youth, young adults, uh, adults, seniors, special needs people, single people, all of that. And he's charged us with that responsibility. And that carries right into uh, our responsibility to youth. The greatest gift that we can give them is to help them to understand the way of Jesus so that they can live a Jesus-shaped life from their heart, their soul, their mind, their body, in their relationships, and in their spirit man or, or spirit woman. That is the gift that we give them. And that is the vision that, that I speak out here and we'll look forward to seeing how we think about that this afternoon. So discipleship being a disciple-making church, discipling youth is the core priority that I carry on my heart. So I'm saying now, how does that happen? Well, it happens through uh, catalytic events. That's uh, Martin's term. I think it's a fantastic term. Catalytic events like pitch, like camp, like uh, canoe trips, you, you, your canoe trip, ad adventures, I call them adventures that you do with your youth. And programs that need to happen. So that, what are the words, you guys use the word container, receptacle. Uh, containers that, that have to be created to get youth together where we, where we can disciple them. But it's more than that. The, the events aren't going to do it. What's going to do it is relationships in the local church. I think you call yours quads. Uh, yeah, you call yours something else, but getting youth together to be discipled, to learn how to walk out the ways of Jesus in their life. So, so that's, uh, you know, I'm curious about what we're going to discover this afternoon about how to, how to walk this out together 
uh, as individuals and leaders within your churches, certainly, but then us as a denomination.